Hello and welcome to the program Spotlight on Catholic Television of Nigeria. Spotlight is a program that addresses various issues, politics, religion, economy, health and well-being of the country. My name is Tony Abba and it is my pleasure to say welcome to the program. Today we are looking at the relationship between Nigeria and Canada and we have a very important person in the studio today. He is Garant Genus. He is a Canadian uh, member of the of Parliament and he will be doing justice to some of our discussion. Sir, you're welcome. Thank you very to much. The program. It's, it's wonderful to be on the program. Yes, you you had you are coming for a very short visit to Nigeria this time. Yes. Uh, well, what is your impression of the Nigerian people? It's been wonderful to be here, and I think uh, one of my biggest impressions certainly is uh, is the optimism uh, okay. that I've seen in all the conversations I've had. Um, every country faces challenges, Nigeria faces challenges, but in all the conversations, uh, what comes through is uh, people's hope for the future and the work that people are doing to, to strengthen the country going forward. Um, one of the reasons why it's exciting for me to be here, of course, is that uh, Nigeria is a huge country, uh, most, most populous in Africa, biggest economy in Africa, with a very young population uh, that is going to continue to grow and continue to shape the world uh, going forward. Uh, and uh, in Canada, we have a very significant, very active uh, Nigerian-Canadian community that's, uh, that's active there as well, building those bridges. So uh, it's great to be here and, and, and see the country on the ground and see the, the energy, dynamism, and optimism that exists here. Okay. Uh, your coming to Nigeria, was it for a business trip or you coming to compare notes between your parliament and that of Nigeria? What's the essence of your visit to Nigeria? Yeah, I mean, uh, officially I think it's, it's designated as a study visit, so I'm, I'm here okay. uh, when, uh, when uh, a minister travels, sometimes uh, travels out of the country when, when the parliament is sitting, uh, sometimes they'll have a member of the opposition travel as well, they call it pairing. Uh, because it's it's important for opposition as well as government to be able to to have some exposure and bring that that perspective back. So uh, while we have our our minister and our prime minister, uh, they're in Rwanda for the for the summit happening there. Uh, I was able to come here to Nigeria as a member of the opposition to uh, experience what's happening here and to meet with people and learn. So I'm uh, I'm connecting with uh, with faith leaders from different communities. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet the vice president. Uh, and uh, I'm here with you and, and uh, meeting just various other NGOs, civil society actors and, uh, and having some good conversation with our uh, Canadian Embassy here. K High Commission is working hard to, uh, to strengthen that relationship to understand more what, what they're doing here as well. Talking about opposition, uh, you are from the opposition party, yeah. right? And uh, we have similar uh, scenario here in Nigeria. Yeah. Uh, what is politics like in Canada? If you are to yeah. explain politics to a lay person on the street yeah. in Nigeria. What will you say politics is like in Canada? Yeah, I guess one place to start is that I know both Nigeria and Canada uh, are, um, are, are regionalized countries and in a sense they're, they're both uh, um, in, their, in their national moments, marriages, coming togethers of, of uh, different peoples People, with different yes. faiths, different, different uh, ethnic backgrounds. In Canada, um, there were the founding nations of, uh, of French, generally, though not all Catholics, and English, generally, though not all uh, Protestant. So you had that kind of coming together as well. And we had our indigenous peoples uh, who, who, at the time of our founding, uh, their contribution wasn't really recognized. And we have some, some moments of very sad history of discrimination. Um, and, and we're now working to come to terms with that. But we're a, um, we're a diverse country. We're a vast country with different regions, uh, with, with uh, two official languages, English and French. And we've become even more diverse uh, ever since our founding, because uh, with, with growing immigration from different parts of the world, what started as this, uh, this marriage of two founding peoples has expanded to really reflect the diversity of, of people from all over the world. So our politics is shaped by that regional diversity, linguistic diversity, uh, and, uh, and there are, of course, ethnocultural and religious differences as well. So I come from the western part of the country. I come from the uh, province of Alberta, uh, which, uh, has, uh, which, which almost all of my province tends to vote for my party, which is the Conservative Party. And, um, 
and we are also a, a province that is uh, very reliant on the oil and gas sector. We have a we have a, a large energy sector, so that's another thing yeah, we kind of have in common with Nigeria. Nigeria. And um, and so, but there's but there's different realities in different regions of the country. And I know for uh, for for any political party in Canada, a big part of that dynamic is uh, is connecting with people across those regional divides. And I'm, I'm just learning about Nigerian politics, but I, I have a sense that you have kind of a similar reality here with uh, the, the Christian and the Muslim community, North and South, and, and different um, linguistic and ethnic uh, backgrounds as well. So I think it's a, it's a common feature of many countries that, that, that uh, uh, those efforts through democratic politics of creating those bridges. Yeah, talking about diversity, Nigeria is also a diverse country with so many linguistic differences and uh, religious differences. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that in Canada you have 62% Christians and some other 23% are those who have no faith, they don't believe in anything, they are just like that. How do you manage your religious diversity? Mm -hmm. I know you also, uh, you also believe in religious freedom. Yes. Absolutely. So in Canada, you can talk about the different religious communities. I think another useful distinction to make is there are people who, in a census, might identify as, um, as uh, connected to a religious community, uh, but aren't that active in their, in their religious practice. And then you would have people for whom uh, faith plays a very important part in your life. So I think when you look at the religious dynamic in Canada, it's, it's useful to look at, yes, we have different faith communities, and we also have for different people, uh, different relative importance uh, of, of that. Um, one of the things they say about Canada when it comes to our religious life is that there's a much higher percentage of people who identify with a religion than uh, participate in the life of a church. Uh, uh, believers but not belongers, yeah, if you like, when it comes to their, their, uh, their, their, their religious connection. So these are, these are all parts of the dynamic as well. And when it comes to religious freedom, we have uh, protections in our, in our constitution for religious freedom, but there are also debates around religious freedom. Uh, there's a few, I guess, recent flashpoints. One, one flashpoint would be uh, one of our provinces has a, a law that limits the ability of people who wear visible religious symbols uh, to serve in roles in the public service. And that's a kind of a flashpoint of debate where, where some people think that's, that's very wrong and other, other people uh, de defend it. Um, other issues of religious freedom have been around uh, uh, protection of, of conscience. People in certain professions who say uh, they don't want to be involved in, uh, you know, we, we have, um, um, like, we have euthanasia in Canada, uh, and some people say, uh, doctors say as a matter of religious freedom, they don't want to participate or refer for that. So that's an area of debate as well. Uh, and then COVID-19 policies, whether, whether churches uh, should be open, uh, under what circumstances, what requirements. So, uh, so we have protections for religious freedom, but we also have debates around it and, and different people uh, taking different positions. And those are debates that I'm, I'm very active in because I think uh, freedom of religion is, is very fundamental. Even for people who aren't religious themselves, freedom of religion is fundamental because freedom of religion is about the ability, uh, uh, it's about recognizing that the dignity of, of, of a person uh, is, isn't, isn't about the material, that there's a, there's a deeper reality to what it means to be a human person than just our material reality. And that starts with us being able to, uh, to look at, our, at the world around us, to, to, to look up into the, the sky and say, what is the meaning of life? What is my purpose here? And, and for the individual to be able to think about and try to answer those questions without somebody else forcing them to answer that question in a certain way. Well, when you talk about freedom of religion, in Africa, religion plays a very important mm -hmm. role, especially in politics. In Canada, can we say the same? Well, I'm, I don't think, uh, I, my understanding from, from the comparisons I've observed is I don't think it plays as much of a role okay. in, uh, in politics. The point I would, I would always make is it's, it's legitimate for, in a pluralistic, diverse society for people uh, who, who, wh whatever's informing their basic convictions, uh, to bring to bring their convictions into the public space, and not to assume that they'll always get their way, uh, but to be able to to share their convictions and to have honest dialogue about that. And I'll just share a, a personal story on this. Um, my grandmother uh, was a Holocaust survivor. She was living in Germany during the Second World War, and she was living in uh, the Munster area of Germany. Uh, an area where there was a there was a Catholic bishop, Clemens von Galen, 
And she wasn't Catholic. Actually, she was uh, Jewish by background, Protestant by, by confession. Uh, but there was this Catholic bishop named Clemens von Galen, uh, who was a loud and brave vocal critic of, uh, of the Nazis. And my grandmother's view was that the reason she was able to survive was because people were sheltering her, and those people were responding to this message of a bishop who was speaking about politics. And I know uh, in, in Nigeria there's some history as well of, of the church uh, during military rule, the church speaking about issues of, uh, of justice and human rights. Uh, and, um, and I think it's, uh, regardless of, of people's backgrounds, uh, it's, it's important to speak about justice and human rights from whatever uh, tradition you come. And there certainly is within, within the Catholic uh, Church uh, here in Nigeria, in Germany where my grandmother was, uh, and in many other places around the world, cases of, of that important role of speaking truth to power coming from the Church. Well, I, I know for some time now the Catholic Bishops Conference of Nigeria have been in the forefront of speaking truth to power. Talking about issues that borders on human rights, freedom of religion, and various other issues that touches on the economy. Uh, as, a, as a parliamentarian, can, do you think this, this uh, relationship between what the parliament needs to do and the ones that has to do, the one that, that touches on the well-being of the people, especially when it comes to believing in what you believe in, like mm -hmm. faith-based aspect of human uh, rights. Can we say there's a distinction or is there a similarity between the one in Nigeria and the one in Canada? In terms of the role of parliamentarians around yes, justice and human rights? Play. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, in, a, in an ideal world, uh, every parliamentarians would, would all be, all, always be thinking about uh, the common good. Uh, about advancing justice and human rights, and 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 defending the and recognizing and defending the dignity of all people. Uh, do parliamentarians in every country fall short of that standard? Absolutely, uh, and and we need to have humility to recognize that and and try to do better. Uh, and I think one of the the great benefits of international dialogue is uh, sometimes sometimes you have different countries with different challenges, uh, and and you can. Uh, I think, in a in a constructive spirit, sharpen each other a little bit through through dialogue. Um, and I know, um, I mean, there are some different challenges here in, 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 in Canada in terms of, of religious freedom. I know one of the biggest religious freedom challenges here is around security. It's yeah. around uh, some of the, the horrific attacks uh, that have happened on churches. And, and I can tell you, people in Canada are aware of that. They're following that. Um, they're, they're praying for the people of Nigeria through this. And um, and, and one of the questions I'm asking my interlocutors here is, uh, is how can we help? Uh, how can we uh, support uh, the efforts that are required to, um, to provide security to, uh, to everyone here in Nigeria, uh, and in particular to protect religious freedom by addressing these security issues? Uh, so, so we have different challenges, but our goals as politicians should be the same, that is to work towards the common good. Okay, when we will be taking a short break, when we return, I'll be asking you the relationship that exists between your own electoral body and that of Nigeria as we edge, as we inch towards the 2023 general elections. Mm -hmm. Well, viewers, the program is still, uh, the program is still spotlight on Catholic television of Nigeria, and I've been speaking with, uh, a Canadian parliamentarian, uh, Janet Gerus, who has been talking about different aspects of the relationship that exists between Canada and Nigeria. And when we come back, we'll continue with the discussion. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back. If you are just joining us, this is Spotlight on Catholic Television of Nigeria. And we've been speaking to a member of Canadian Parliament, Garnet Janus. Before we went on that short break, I was saying we will be looking at 
the forthcoming election in Nigeria mm -hmm. and how Canada will be of immense support to make the election a success. But before then, I would like to ask you this question. The religious situation in Nigeria, mm -hmm. I believe you are not new to the attacks on churches. Yes. People killed in the worship centers and yeah. everybody, not, it seems like nothing is, uh, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. How do people view this kind of situation from outside, I mean from the West? Yeah. Yeah, uh, there has been uh, growing uh, awareness of it and growing discussion of it in, in Canada. Um, and I think it's, it's something that people um, are, are working to try to understand more. Uh, there are some similarities in terms of, of, of our countries, but there are a lot of, of differences. So just, um, you, you know, you, you see an item like that in the news and um, you know, it's horrifying. And I think the, the first step is to, is to speak out and try to draw more awareness to it and, and certainly uh, ask the government to be, uh, the government of our country to be engaging with the government of Nigeria to say, you know, what's the situation? Can we help? Um, and, and part of why I'm here is I really want to understand more. And I think one of the things I've, I've learned is uh, there, there's the issue of attacks on, on churches, attacks on Christians, and that's in the context of a, uh, of a, a really challenged situ situation when it comes to security. There's issues of Boko Haram, there's issues of, of banditry, um, and and there's there's issues of of Hesman crisis. Um, yeah, it, it, from us crisis, so to say. Yeah, it, it, exactly. So so um, uh, understanding the the sort of the context of those security issues and trying to you know recognizing that that the solutions to those problems are going to come from Nigeria. It's going to be uh, Nigerian people, Nigerian leaders that are going to identify the solutions to those problems. Um, but but but. Um, we're very concerned about it, uh, and we we I think we, we need to highlight uh, that that uh, that that all all life all is 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 of the same value anywhere in the world, uh, and and certainly my commitment is is to continue to highlight and raise these issues in Canada, and and to encourage our government to come alongside and support uh, Nigerian civil society, the, the Nigerian faith communities, the Nigerian government uh, in in trying to address these these issues that vitally need a response. Well, the issue of insecurity and attacks on churches did not start today. I think mm -hmm. it's been there for quite a long time now. Yeah. And from what you're, you're saying now, there's need for more awareness to be created. But I think that the West is not oblivious of the fact that something like this is happening. Why do you think there's been this uh, long silence from the West? Is it that the problem is also overwhelming them, or there's nothing they can do to help Nigeria. I mean, I think sometimes people pay less attention to problems that they that they can't automatically think of the solution for. If you identify a problem and you say, "Well, and here's what we need to do to solve it," um, maybe there's a there's a a tendency to focus on that to to get to a solution. Uh, but if you if you see a problem. Um, that's in it. Maybe it's in a different cultural context, and you just have a hard time understanding. Well, well, what's going on here? And there are um, there's a lot of complexity to some. I mean, there there are uh, there's there's the question of relationship between faith communities, but there's also kind of the overlay of of uh, resource conflicts, the kind of farmer herder uh, dynamics, and there's um, then there's there's the um, you know the, the whole kind of complicated history of, of the country. And and so um, it, it can be hard to sort of wrap your mind around some of these dynamics of someone coming from the outside. Uh, but my um, my encouragement to my fellow countrymen uh, will be, and I think this process is already happening. The world is becoming smaller, right? People are people are receiving more of this news as well, uh, and and the images are are coming closer to home, uh, recognizing that it's that it's become sadly a, a frequent occurrence. There have been attacks on on churches here. Uh, many people have died. Uh, it's a it's a significant threat to religious freedom, to the ability for people to practice their faith in, in security. Uh, this does require uh, a strong response, locally and internationally, uh, and we need to be there to help however we can. Okay, Nigeria will be going for a general election next year, 2023. Yeah. What area of collaboration do you think Canada can give to Nigeria to make the election successful? Well, uh, 
there, there's some conversation ongoing in Canada actually about the role that we can play internationally uh, supporting and strengthening uh, democracies around the world. Uh, there's a number of, um, of institutions uh, coming out of the United States that, that do some of this work uh, and there is now a desire for Canada to, to play this role. And I'm not speaking just specifically about Nigeria but, but, but in general. Um, and uh, and I, I think you know, following the example of the United States it would be important for Canada's engagement in this way to be nonpartisan, to be reflective of uh, of all the different political parties in Canada, uh, being able to, to to come together and offer support uh, here here on the ground. Um, it, it's sadly part of the history here that that election times is a time where we see we see violence, uh, and um, how to how to recognize that dynamic, address it, address issues of. Uh, of, of corruption that have sometimes been associated with with the voting process. Um, there's there's a lot of work to be done, and I know Nigerians are doing that work. There are there are leaders, civil society organizations, people that are are speaking out about these issues. Uh, but uh, but I think we can hopefully play a supportive role as well, uh, partnering with uh, and, and just just having good dialogue about uh, some of the some of the challenges we have and have overcome in Canada. Uh, and uh, and offering support. Obviously, it's a critical time for for Nigeria, right? This 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 election uh, uh, is uh, it's it's a critical time, and um, and I think you know it's important for us to be there as as a country to be supportive. Talking about being a critical time, I think this election is uh, going to be one of those elections that Nigerians have been waiting for, because if you look at it now, there's a lot of youth involvement. Yes in the voters registration. Yeah. Now that takes us to the next question. Do you think the youths in Nigeria have the ability and the capacity to take back their country and make a difference in this election? Yeah, it's a it's a great question and I don't know that I fully have the, the expertise having been here for uh, about 48 Those hours to be yeah. but I, I will say one thing that's very interesting to me about Nigeria that's different from Canada. Um, the the uh, the average age here is so much younger, right? People have more children here. Uh, you, you've got a, a, a young population, and I, I mean, I think it's beautiful. I, I have five kids in my family, which I, I understand having five kids would be would be no big deal, very normal yeah, here. Yeah. It's so fairly unusual in Canada, um, and uh, here the average age is I think between eighteen and nineteen. In in Canada, the average age. Uh, is I think between 41 and 42. So we've got we've got an older population. So of course in Canada people talk about the young people. What are the young people thinking? What are the young people doing? Uh, but relatively there's there's so uh, there's there, there's fewer of them in Canada. Uh, here in Nigeria, uh, the um, the direction set by youth who who are coming out to register in larger numbers and are engaging with the political process. Uh, is is very different. Just the proportions are are, are different. So uh, it will be very interesting to see uh, the role that's played by by youth here uh, in in again such a young young and growing and energetic country. For us in Nigeria here, organizing election seems to be like a, a war situation, kind of mm -hmm. because of the various interests that will come to play. Yeah. How do you organize election in your country, and what are the similarities that we have between Nigeria and Canada? Yeah, it, we don't have security issues in the context of, of, of elections. Um, I would say typically, I don't, I don't think we've really had any uh, security events in the context of, uh, of, of elections, and uh, we have, um, um, I mean, we have a longer history of democracy yeah. in Canada, obviously. Um, and it's uh, it's always interesting for me to travel to, to younger countries because I think um, it, there's such an appreciation of, of democracy when it's relatively new. In Canada, uh, we've we've had kind of continued constitutional continuity. I mean, some, some some amendments, but but general continuity of our constitutional system and democracy uh, since our founding 150 years ago. Um, uh, so I mean, we have hotly contested elections, uh, fiercely debated. Um, uh, and uh, we have, you know, between we've we've got kind of two major national parties. We've got a third party that that runs nationally, but uh, it kind of usually comes in third or fourth place. And then we have a one interesting feature about Canada is that we have a, a democratic separatist party. We have a party that um, that that wants to 
separate from the country, uh, but they wanted, but, but but peacefully, and they participate in democratic debate, and they participate in our our parliament. So I, I think I think that's fairly rare in the world, but I think it's a good model that, that people who uh, who are aspiring to that uh, are nonetheless uh, able to present themselves democratically, be in parliament, uh, and and make their case. And I mean, most people disagree with them, but but it's. Um, I think we, we, we are able to integrate into our democratic politics a real diversity of, of perspectives and do so peacefully. So we have challenges, but I think that's, that's one of our big strengths. Okay, talking about um, Canada and Nigeria and the relationship, I know there are, there are times when you want immigrants yes. to come to your country uh, to help especially African countries. Do you mm -hmm. have any special provision for Nigerians to visit your country? Yes, so uh, I serve on the Immigration Committee in Parliament as well as the Foreign Affairs Committee. And, uh, and there's, uh, there, there's a big focus on immigration in Canada. And I mentioned the demographics. This is part of it, right? We have an aging population. Yes. Uh, and so uh, newer immigrants to the country, they, they, uh, they help to fill some of those, those gaps when you have an aging population. Um, so, so that's, you know, and, and I think Canadians feel universally across the political spectrum uh, that the, the diversity of our country, the different perspectives and experiences people bring uh, really enrich our country. They also enrich our, our international relationships. So uh, part of what has facilitated some of the meetings I've had here uh, is the presence of Nigerian Canadians who are friends of mine who were able to make contacts. Uh, and uh, so, so it's, it's helped me to do my job better, that, that, that role played by, by diaspora communities. So in terms of our immigration system, there are, there are different categories. I know many uh, Nigerians uh, come to Canada as students. Uh, some will come for, for business or to visit. Uh, so there are, there are different categories and, um, and you, know, you've, you can make the application under, under those different categories for those who want uh, to, to come. Uh, we have a program specifically for Nigeria for students, a Nigerian okay. Student Express. Um, and uh, I think uh, some, some, some people who come will, will stay. Many students who come to Canada study then come back and, and bring that experience. So, um, so, so I think the, the, the immigration has been a real, a real strength for Canada and it's been part of what has uh, deepened our ties. It will make our country even more globally connected going forward. Uh, the fact that uh, when we engage with another country, uh, we have people within Canada who bring a knowledge and experience of that country in almost every case. As we round off, I would like you to to tell us about the the relationship between Canada and Nigeria. Is it cordial? In what aspects have we been relating very well? As uh, talking about uh, the partnerships. Yeah, I, I think uh, we I think we've got a good relationship. And I also think that there's just more that can be done. I think we can strengthen that relationship through uh, through more engagement, more dialogue, and I'm I'm hopeful that my presence here can can play some constructive role in that. Um, I think I think both our countries are are important countries. I think the, the Canadian model of uh, of uh, pluralism is is a good one and one that we want to we want to share. Uh, I think uh, Nigeria's youth and vitality uh, is going to shape the world in in many ways in the years to come. Uh, and of course, uh, I think all of us have an investment in uh, in supporting Nigeria's uh, efforts when it comes to to security and and. Uh, um, I know that that uh, that that will have implications beyond Nigeria's borders as well. So uh, we need to continue to work on and 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 grow that relationship. Uh, and uh, and I, I think there's a lot of potential and opportunity to do that. Finally, I will not let you go without asking you this question on a lighter note. Have you tested any Nigerian food? I have had a little bit, yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, I've, I've traveled in a few different. This is my first time here in Nigeria, but I've. I've been to a few other places. My wife's family's from India, so I'm I'm kind of used to trying different kinds of food, spicy food, and um, I really like plantains. I know the plantains are more common in in Africa in general. Africa, I think they're yes. harder to get in uh, uh, harder to get in Canada, but uh, I've enjoyed what I've what I've tried so far, and uh, I think after this interview, we're gonna we're gonna go try a bit more. So looking forward to that. <laughs> Thank you very much for spending your time with us. We've been speaking to a member of the Canadian Parliament. Garnet Genus, who is visiting Nigeria, and like you heard him, he has tested a plantain, and he hoped to taste more food when we end this interview. 
Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you, viewers, for sparing your time with us. My name is Tony Abba, and this is where we are going to be dropping the anchor for this edition of the program, Spotlight on Catholic Television of Nigeria. Stay tuned to other programs. Bye for now. You are watching CTV 